Ale <laughs> Um So let us take a little bit of uh, time with each other, and afterwards, there's also an opportunity for a question and answer. Um, if, I, if, you, if you can't hear me, just ask me. I grew up in Kansas, so the sunflowers are Kansas natural uh, a flower. And also, too, uh, in the high school days, uh, I was on a custom combine cutting crew going into western Kansas uh, cutting uh, wheat. And so the, um, the icons in my footprint and objects that I celebrated on the landscape were oftentimes the, the big uh, grain elevators. And I would drive the truck up, sitting there waiting for them to unload the truck and then go back out to the field to get the next one. So I spent a lot of time in the summer months out uh, in western Kansas and enjoying time uh, uh, in the prairie uh, and of the open space. Growing up in Topeka, Kansas, my father was in medical and I had a great childhood. Uh, my family was nurturing. Uh, we had good times. I have a sister. Uh, so my childhood was, was joyful and also exploring all the time and looking into uh, you know, the world around me. Uh, my parents, uh, my mother and father, and this is my sister. But the reason I share this image with you is that all the clothing that we have on are made by my grandparents. They were a mom and pop tailor uh, store or shop. And so I remember as a small boy, my father would go on Saturday and put me up on the cutting, big cutting board where the fabric would be rolled out. And I would watch my grandfather talk to the customer, you know, putting the fabric over the arm and saying, well, this tweed is in this year and so forth. And there were even cardboard maquettes of, you know, the, of the model with the clothing on. But I remember that situation and my grandmother doing the buttonhole and looking on her irony, you know, but not until I became more senior that I began to realize that in my DNA, I come from a family of, of makers and measurements and precision and getting the right cut and putting the pattern down. So it was, it was a long, took a long time for that wake up to bring to me that I did, I really do come from a family uh, of making and the, a craft. So uh, the clothing that we all have on was tailored in my grandparents' uh, tailor shop. Again, my world is about adornment and many different cultures have enriched my visual and my thinking. And what more uh, personal could, you know, tattooing or painting the body uh, or taking and taking feathers or perhaps around the arm, just taking uh, skin and wrapping it. So again, I look at and think about, about the body as an armature and something that I explore. If I'm ever stuck, museums are very, very important to me because if I, if I ever am stuck and someone said, do you ever get stuck, Bob, and don't know what to do or what to make? I said, if, if I am, all I have to do is go to the museum and stand before the musical instrument display case at the Metropolitan, because I was using the Met for quite a while, because I was near living in New Pulse. But anyway, the museums are my sketchbooks. They are my history. I belong to a family of makers. And so the museums become so important for me to regenerate my battery, to take me into, you know, into the arms and armor, looking at weaponry or looking at, at helmets engraved, inlaid, or the musical instrument where beautiful inlaid abalone shell in the, in the guitar. So museums have become very, very important to me. So I love going to the museum and the importance of that. I also realize that I, I belong to a family and the tools that we see in this, in, in this etching on the wall, many of the things that are going on are the tools and instruments that I work with and they've been handed down. So that brings me back to that whole thing about family. So I've enjoyed with today with some of the people I was with asking them about family and do you know, do you know your footprint? Do you know who opened up the doors for you to be radical and do installation work? Or, you know, kind of pinning them down to think about their journey at this time and the sense of 
they do belong to a group of makers. And that goes way back. Go to the Polynesian Islands or go to, uh, to the South Sea and, and see people working with shell and rope and skin uh, and animal fur or teeth. So being brought into that. Are they the trophies from the leopards, claws, etc. The, the kill, the hunt, the celebration of you know being, being the warrior. So again, we do. Those of us who are on that journey have found ourselves very much. I think, or at least I feel, very seriously connected. During my Fulbright time, leaving um, the University of Kansas, uh, going to the Scandinavian countries and uh, going to the, the Academy for Arts and Crafts. Uh, it was at that time where uh, the teachers talked about craftsmanship and precision and clean. And if you notice that the piece is highly polished and with the, these pieces down, they move also to very clear on the design sense. And you'll see later on how radically I changed in the 60s from the work that I became so ingrained with there. Uh, and the craftsmanship at my graduate time, I didn't get pinned down or be with people that were that anal and that sense of craftsmanship and honor. Uh, but I found during that Fulbright time, it was important. Another thing that I want to just touch on at this moment about the Fulbright. I'm a severe dyslexic person. I was in the closet and I had incredible writing problems and reading problems. Um, I was in at the University of Kansas. They had what they called the boat hand English class. And it was the, uh, those of us could hardly write a sentence. So we were in this special group and so forth. And it was, a, I barely, I hung on during graduate school and undergraduate many times coming very close to failing out. But because I, needed to express myself with my hands, the craftsmanship and so forth. So I was doing strong in the making, but I was doing so poor in the academic situation. I was walking out of the studio one night at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was in ceramics. And I looked up on the wall uh, on the pin board and there was this, I still remember, yellow and black poster. And it said, Fulbright, study abroad. I'm standing there looking at this going, wow, you know, I'm about to graduate and, you know, Fulbright. <laughs> But that's for scholars, and oh my God, that'd be so. But you know, no way, Jose. So I left, but I remember that, that experience. About three or four days later, walking across campus, I was, the library was in front of me, and I turned and I went into the library, and, and I went up and I, the stairs, and went into this room, and it was the Fulbright office. And I walked and I said, uh, she said, uh, Oh, are you here? I said, Well, uh, my do you have to speak a foreign language? I could hardly do it well in English, let alone writing, you know. She said, no, I mean, the Scandinavian countries, Australia, uh, you know, there are many countries that the requirement is you don't have to have the language, the language proficiency there. I said, okay. Um, she said, well, I said, well, can I? So she gave me one form. I said, no, can I have another one? Or give me two more. She said, but you only need one form. But she didn't know that I knew that I, because I didn't type, I knew when I went down and started filling out that form, I would misspell things. And I, what do I, you know, what do I do? So I needed to have that backup, that safety net. So I took three forms and I began to research where I thought I, so Scandinavia was known for, George Jensen, of course, was a highly known, but Scandinavia was well known for silver and gold and enamel. So I applied to Norway. Long story short, I did receive a Fulbright. I remember standing up on that stage that night. I was the only art student that had, at that time that had gotten a Fulbright. I was saying, this person was going to study medicine. This person was going to go and study theory. This one here was going to study geology. I remember standing there and he came and gave me this piece of paper. And I was standing there with a great deal of emotion. I realized that, you know, I didn't think I was worthy for this. This is for scholars. So what I want to say to those of you that are looking at you know, proposals for grants or whatever, if you want to dance, you've got to get on the dance floor. It's only paperwork. 
But I counted myself out of the ball game because I, I was so, uh, so struggling with dyslexia situation and I was so in the closet that, uh, but you know, after I got the Fulbright and, and excited and I went off and, you know, four years later, I was sitting on, in Florida, my te first teaching job, and I picked up Art in America. I was in the bathroom, sitting on the stool, matter of fact, and looking through the back, and I saw it said, oh, Grants. And I looked, and I saw it said Tiffany Grant, and it was for the, uh, for the crafts area. It wasn't for the fine arts this time around, it was for the crafts. And I said, you know, well, why don't you write and get that form? And, you know, you kind of know that you've got to fill out this form. I did it. I felt strong. Bingo. I got a Fulbright, I mean a Tiffany Grant. And I went back to Norway and worked uh, in, a, in a goldsmith shop. So the Scandinavian pieces became very important because you notice how the clarity of the form, the high polish, this is a double spouted uh, teapot. Uh, and it's now in the, in the, uh, in the Yale collection of, of silver, along with a Paul Revere example, and also other uh, notable uh, historian pieces. But that piece is sitting there in that collection. And it was designed and executed during my time on the, on the, uh, on the uh, Fulbright time. But then when I came back from the Tiffany Grant, I began to become more radical. And I began to find myself working with materials in the uh, mid-60s that was very unorthodox to uh, what was going on in America in the jewelry direction, meaning that I was taking my jewelry skills and celebrating the ABCs, but I was using materials that were very unorthodox. It wasn't dealing with high-end materials, but you know, here's a, a, for those of you that are photographers, I took a tin type from the flea market. So the tin type is here, here's his body, I cut his head off, put, instead of putting a stone here, I put this, embezzled it in, this is from the Cracker Jack box, and it's the title is The Man with His Pet Bee. Uh, and copper around here, this is from a disc off of, a, of an airplane. So I was beginning to mix, now think back. Think back to this, how radical a shift that was going on. So my, my palette was beginning to get rearranged and I began to swim upstream with unusual materials. But um, a well-known jeweler who's now passed away said, Bob, you know, if you stay in this game long enough, there will be an image or there will be images that will continue to be that will resurface. I was listening to him and now at 76 years old, I realized that this image has been reproduced and published in so many publications. And it is coming full circle. What Herman said is that there are certain images, if you're really serious about your work, that might continue to be re, uh, reused if it's for scholarly purposes or in publication. But this piece, many people say, Bob, where is the man with the pet? Who, who owns that piece? And so, so again, it's now at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in their collection uh, in that. So working with materials that I might find uh, on the, in the parking lot or on walk to school. Uh, and here's a charm bracelet of, again, found parts, uh, Barbie doll parts, uh, uh, pieces from film cans. So I'm mixing up the, the vocabulary and being very open about uh, the material, use of materials. Another way that my mind might work such as this. What you're looking at is, you know, when a car is broken into, and all that shards of glass along the, and I would scoop up those shards of glass and bring them back to the studio, wash them, put them out in the sun, get them dry. And what, what I was doing is, it's like looking through ice. The white behind the, the shards of glass is nothing more than uh, a heavy foam board or foam that I can cut on the bandsaw file, make the shape I want, and then I very simply set this on a piece of wax paper, the, the styrofoam boat shape. It's a boat shape about three inches long, it's rather large. And then with a caulking gun, using silicone caulk like you, when you put a new shower uh, glass in the shower curtain, or instead of a curtain, you caulk it till you push the glass up so it doesn't fall out. 
with the caulking gun, I had to go around here, stop, like a cake decoration, to, with my tweezers, put one, build that wall, go around the other side, then again on top of that. So to lay another layer, lay just like laying the bricks, one by one, selecting it. So my mind is oftentimes investigating materials and how can that cast off be somewhat brought into my frame of uh, design and aesthetic. So we're looking at one that is looking like looking through uh, pieces of uh, ice. And then I began to take and pick up beach glass and introducing color to the white. And then I also got to the point where I would take and do this piece and totally paint it with gesso so it was all white and then come back with a paper towel and begin to wipe away the uh, white pigment. Then I would take and take uh, gum, draw, uh, gum boppers powder pigment with, vas with uh, turpentine, paint it. So then what happened to the, instead of it being transparent, Instead of being, what would happen is that in between here, there's this caulking material. But when I would mix up the powdered pigment and with turpentine and paint it, the, that would seep into those crevices. So then the matrix, the, 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 it would begin to act like a little bricks being placed into place with the color being from the dried powder. So my mind oftentimes will go the unorthodox way and see what I can do with that cast off. Um, the last big body of work that I did, it was an exhibition that um, was called Keep It in the Can. I hate when, I, I don't hate, I dislike when the students bring in the crushed um, Coke cans or that uh, aluminum. The aluminum is so thin it has no integrity. You can't bend it, you can't solder it. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So oftentimes I did not find the crushed aluminum cans attractive. But one day I was walking to school and I looked down and someone had stamped on the can and it was there. And I, all of a sudden, for those jewelers here, all of a sudden I looked and realized that this circle was like a bezel. So I thought, wow, if I took and what if I made something and dropped inside that circle and figured out how to attach it, I could take these ugly cans and I could come back and build my own story in here. Why enamel when I get all of this wonderful color and the graphics? So I began to hone in on, on that found can and start thinking, what could I creatively investigate and be playful and do something with? So I made a series of pieces called Keep It in the Can. So then, drilled a hole, took my saw, cut this out, I can peek through here now, took a piece of tin behind here, took this piece and wired it down. So I built my own gemstone and in place and here, for those who are jewelers, that is how I'm trapping that Aluminum can, it's light, it's color. I create my own gemstone inside. I put the back on, good to go. So I did 27 of them and, um, and many of them have found their ways to the museum collection, etc. The silver Taza is now just recently has become part of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts uh, uh, permanent collection and I'm happy to see that it's found this resting for this new home but again the shards of glass from the brooch revisited that on the lathe I turned a piece of wood a cylinder piece of wood also this shape cut down so it's kind of like a fruit compote like my mother had when they you know had the glass piece on the top for the cake or whatever so then I spray painted it black uh, with my caulking compound. I started row after row up to here and stopped. Then I made a silver cylinder to slip onto the wood 
here, here. There's a screw that screws up into this wooden piece. And then the whole underneath side was encrusted with the shards of glass. And then across here is 19 inches across. And there's 109 uh, pieces of beach glass and beach pebbles that have been bezeled and put into place. So building this piece together uh, and celebrating the found objects of, from the beach and also to uh, the shards of glass, but it is now finds itself at the museum. I'm very fortunate that there are 29 museums around the world have examples of my work. So that's very nice that I have that uh, cachet or that celebration. But you know, I've worked hard to bring the piece of work. And I've gone upstream in the sense of the way I've approached it. Uh, A very wealthy family in Italy commissioned architects, and I was the only jeweler, to execute a piece for their permanent collection. Clayto Bonori was the name. And um, so there's $90,000 worth of gemstones and gold in this necklace. The balls are about a little bit smaller than a tennis ball, two half pieces domed and soldered together. And then the diamonds, uh, are all encrusted here. Pearls, uh, jasper, onyx, pearls. And so anyway, real tour de force piece. And it was done. I flew over to deliver the piece at the celebration. Michael Graves, the architect, Stanley Tigerman, an architect. These were the kind of the, the architects that had been asked to also design the piece. Those architects did the drawings took the drawings to the workshop and had another person make them because those men and women are not jewelers, so they didn't know how to put it together. So they outsourced it or went to someone to fabricate it. I fabricated the piece. Came back after this lavish gathering. Oh, I all pumped up, felt that was really good. And when I came home, there was a, a letter waiting for me. And it was this letter from the Victorian Albert Museum. And they had just purchased this paper necklace for their historical jewelry collection. And it's on display permanently along with their other examples of jewelry history. And it's nothing more than that same foam board or same uh, styrofoam. It's, it's not the pithy ones that my mother used to make the Christmas tree and put all the pins in that are kind of smooshy. This, these balls were firm, but they were also definitely styrofoam. Uh, and then encrusted decoupage with paper and gold foil and lacquer. And the piece was purchased for their collection not because of the intrinsic value of diamonds and gemstones. It was more about they were celebrating the thinking and, and the designer and the maker about their, their journey. So it was to put those two slides together about point and counterpoint is that here, this is all about in value of gemstones and gold. And here, all of a sudden, coming home feeling pretty pumped that I get this letter from the Victorian Albert celebrating this piece. I have so many interesting pictures on postcards or now on the computer of people standing at the Victorian, standing in that case and pointing at the piece. This is a picture of Louis Bailey, Bob and Louis a drawing of Louis. We're wearing these paper hats, not yarmulkes, but paper hats. <laughs> Louis came with his mother and father to have dinner one night with all the grown-ups, the only child. After dinner, I said, Louis, uh, let's go and do some drawings. Uh, I had paper and cardboard and, and markers so the adults could have adult time and have time not with Louis at the table. So he and I played, did all these drawings, and giggled and talked. And so when he went away, I looked down at the drawings. I said, oh, so I cut it and made a postcard and turned it over to Louis. I said, I had a great evening. Come back and let's play again. And I sent it to Louis. His mother's a painter. His father is the head of the psych department. But anyway, when he would get off the bus, he would always come into his mother's studio, and so there was paper on the floor. I said, why don't you make a card for Bob? So Louis and I, for a year, started sending postcards back and forth. 
And I got so jazzed on it, I would wake up sometimes on Monday morning and, you know, at 6 o'clock after coming back from the gym, I'd make four of them. So he, every day I'd go, keep them coming, you know, keep pushing on it. And he would do the same thing. But he also realized he couldn't write. He couldn't write the ABCs yet. So, but he knew that, the, that when he put a stamp on it, that he would put it in the, his post box and it would come to Bob. I was getting postcards with no address on them, no postcards, but they still find their way to the house. So when we were invited to, at a local restaurant, to have Bob and Louie show, because I, I know you're doing these postcards, would you like to? I said, okay, Louie, do you want to have this exhibition? He said, yeah, let's do that. I said, well, you bring your cards, and I'll bring my cards, and we'll put them up in the, in the place. So when he came to do that, I said, well, okay, Louie, he had a stack of them. Where? He said, let's put that one over there, okay? And I'd run over there and pin it on, now where? Over there. So the show just was, was everywhere. So then his mom took this picture, and this was the picture they put on the postcard. And it was called the Bob and Louie Show. At the opening, Louie had balloons and Kool-Aid and goldfish for the reception. When the postcards came, Louie was quite proud. So he went down to the post office, and he couldn't reach, he, the counter was here, and he'd come up at each one of the tellers and put the postcard. And all of a sudden, they went, oh no, that's... And they made the connection because the postcards had been going over the year, been going back, some of them now with no address on them. So the newspaper wrote it up as a three-way collaborative between the U.S. Postal Department of Greenville, <laughs> Bob and Louie. But it, what he gave me that night, and what I want to give you, if I give you nothing else, that every time I sit down to, the to my work, finish the work, Louie comes back into my, and he said, Bob, just be playful. And as I get older, my plate gets fuller, and I get more things to try to figure out. And sitting down and being playful at my workbench is the most wonderful gift that Louis has given me. And I just gave a talk in Greenville, and Louis now is in his second year at the university in, Winston, in the uh, Chapel Hill. And um, he came, and it was so nice to be able, we had the postcards up. I had the ones that I'd saved. But it was nice that night to say to Louie personally, just, Louie, you gave me the gift that I say thank you because it has made all the difference in the world when I sit down. I burn up pieces, I trash pieces, I think the things that don't work. But what Louie said, hey, come on, Bob, be playful, you know? Kick back and enjoy what you're doing. I try to make order out of chaos. This is my workbench, and so I'm assembling parts, but my, my world is about clutter and then trying to make uh, or, uh, information out of it. And this is at my workshop, is it in my home? I only have one piece of power equipment and it's, it's this little drill press right here. <laughs> Everything else is done by hand, filing, sawing, da da da. And I'm about component building parts. I'm not a good silversmith. The big silver Taza was a major challenge about how to put all that piece together. And for those of you that are people in the metal and those who are not in that area, but all those stones that are set on that center disc, if, I'm, if I was trying or if you were trying to solder all those 100 or all those 90 bezels down, what would happen is often as that center disc would get warped because of the heat. So what happens, all of a sudden, now that's no longer flat. So I knew that if I did this, I don't have the skills to get that plate back down flat. So Michael, what did, how did I figure out what to do here? So I thought, hmm. You cut it into little tiles. Why would I do that? Uh, to, to separate your hazards. <laughs> so I sat there and said, I'm not skilled enough to be able to make that work. But if I took, like if it was a pizza, took my pizza thing and cut it up into sections, now I had this section, I could solder two bezels down on it. I could then take and put the puzzle back together and then figure out how to get it all together and instead of gluing it down, I could rib it section after section down. So it was, 
very interesting that because I knew I didn't have that skill, but I, that's what I wanted. So how do I take another, another way to solve that problem? In a few years back, I received a letter from the North Carolina from the governor, and it was the governor's award for the arts. Uh, and then that night there was a big celebration. I didn't realize what a big ado it was, but anyway, this is the governor Purdue and myself that night at the uh, celebration. But it was uh, the state, and your state also celebrates uh, oftentimes people in, in different fields, if it's medicine, if it's engineering, architecture, uh, and the arts. And this was uh, that night of being a part of, of that. And um, so the, the fact is that it was um, an evening of celebration and uh, one that I remember strongly. Two gentlemen that are in my life that um, are collectors, they call themselves collectors, and those of you, there are these men and women that enjoy supporting the arts, if it's drawing, painting, photography, sculpture, or whatever, and these are two men, Ron and Joe, who um, ha have a very deep uh, collection of ceramics, paintings, and jewelry, and um, I was at Penland at the Penland auction some years back, and this gentleman was sitting uh, on the porch of what they call the North Light in the rocking chair waiting for the big event. And um, I was waiting for the, t the big celebration and auction. And this gentleman said, hi, uh, Bob, um, I'm Ron Porter. And so we kind of chatted and I sat down with him and we were chatting about uh, the Penland auction and where are you from? I'm from South Carolina and, and uh, oh, I'm living in such and such. And then he says to me, oh, by the way, uh, do you still have that, the work, remember the, the stick necklace? Um, and I went, yeah, I still own that piece. This was like maybe eight years ago. I said, I still own that piece. And he said, well, you know, if you, if when you get back home and if you could send me a photograph of it, I, I might be interested in it. So I get up and I walk away. All of a sudden this light bulb goes on. I said, wait a minute, this was eight years ago. I don't even know this person. I don't even know this person, but he's been, but he's aware of my work, aware of, so then I sent it, and so now they own like 80 some pieces of my work, but they are serious scholarly uh, collectors of the adornment, and it's, but it's, that was a very interesting experience with them, and we, so they bought that one piece, and then there was an exhibition that they came to see in North Carolina and we went, they said we want to see the exhibition because there are a number of pieces and then they picked up uh, the little spreadsheet and the names of everything. And we walked around that afternoon and they had a lot of the work they'd never seen before and they said well tell me about this piece, tell me about that piece and they were looking at the spreadsheet so we talked about it. So this year I'm teaching and they come from South Carolina to say hello and look at what the students are doing. And they say, at breakfast, they pull that spreadsheet out and lay it down. And they said, we're very interested in this work. I'm looking at, no, you gotta be kidding, no. We can't pay you all now, but we can do it on payout. Are you for real? And they had me by the short hair because the prices were on it. So as we sat down seriously and looked at the spreadsheet, I said, oh no, too much money on this piece. No, instead of $1,000, it's $600. Then this one over here, they didn't have mark. I said, this one's important. Yes, you're gonna go for this. So we <laughs> went back and forth and negotiated figures and for the next four years, they paid out over the time. But, you know, you don't come across that serious a situation. Well, the reason I bring up their, this is because they're scholars. And I said, why would you track anybody? Because we wanted to select a situation to collect someone in depth to, to show the humble, begin, you know, that journey. So they've been, they're good friends and, um, 
and they still are seriously involved with the arts. But uh, I only bring that up because they have been very much a part of my world and supporting my enthusiasm for what I do and in a sense. But they're scholars and they're very, very well versed in adornment. And they don't own my work, they own many pieces of work of, of people internationally and nationally. But they, they're far and few, but they're, they're good friendships and we work very carefully about that friendship. The friendship is more valuable to me than the dollar bill in that sense. This is the end of my peep show, and I say thank you for being a part of the evening. And I've enjoyed coming and being your guest, and I look forward to hopefully to return again and uh, have time with faculty, your community, as well as, as the students. So thank you for being with me this evening.